All right, good morning. Committee on Parole is called to order this morning. Today is Monday, April 1st, 2024. The time is 9.05 a.m. My name is Cheryl Renatz. I'm serving as chairman of today's parole panel. My colleagues on the panel with me this morning, seated to my left, Mr. Steve Prater, to my right, Mr. Chuck Tillis. We are at DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge. Uh, I'd like to get the staff here at DOC headquarters to introduce yourself for the record, please. Jen, Carla Williams. Mark L. Lewis. Francis Abbott. Okay, our remote location, our first remote location this morning <clears throat> is at Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women. With the staff there at uh, LCIW, please introduce yourself for the record. Kristen Thomas, Warden. Sarah P, ARDC Manager. Acting Daddy, ARDC Supervisor. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, our first case is Ms. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Johnson, would you introduce yourself? Tell us um, your name and DOC number, please. My name is Thea Johnson. Uh, my DOC number is 436763. Okay, and you have counsel this morning. Counsel, would you introduce yourself, please? Good morning. Robert Lancaster with LSU Parole and Reentry Clinic here today representing uh, Ms. Johnson. With me is Sydney Curtis. She's a third year law student uh, in the Parole and Reentry Clinic. She's certified under Rule 20. Uh, so she will be representing uh, Ms. Johnson today as a certified legal intern. Okay, thank you. And um, Mr. Lancaster, will you also be uh, participating in the presentation? I have that you'll be speaking. Will you be speaking at the end? If if the committee deems it appropriate, Ms. Curtis would make the final statement at the end of the hearing. Okay, thank you. And let me recognize the folks who are here um, today in support. We have the Parole Project, Carrie Myers, who will be speaking at the appropriate time. Uh, we have there at LCIW your aunt, Miss Linda. Uh, let's see, cousin Charlene, your dad, uh, Mr. Joey, uh, stepmother Francine. Uh, let's see. And here at headquarters, we have uh, Kathleen Jennings, Carolyn Adams. Let's see. Christy Sheremy, Michelle Rhodes, and also uh, on Zoom, we have Cynthia DeQueer, who is observing. Here in opposition, we have Scotty Johnson, Larry Walker, Johnny Johnson, uh, Diane, excuse me, Dwayne Walters, Libby Johnson, and the DA's office with Mr. Philip Terrell and Derek Johnson. And for those who've indicated they'd like to speak at the appropriate time, we'll allow them to do so. First, uh, Thea, I'm going to read some information into the record. I'm going to ask you to verify that information. Then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Prater. Your case has been assigned to him this morning. He'll take the lead on the interview. Once we're done with our questions, we'll hear from the folks who want to speak on your behalf and support. We'll call on them. Then we'll hear from the opposition. And at the end, you'll be allowed to make a statement before your attorney makes their presentation and closes it out for us, okay? Yes, ma'am. So you are Thea Johnson. Your DOC number is 436-763. You're currently serving a life sentence. You were sentenced in Rapides Parish, <clears throat> most recently July 27th. 2018 for a first degree murder. That was resentencing uh, where you, the parole restriction was removed from your sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So your parole eligibility date is determined to be July 22nd, 2024. Is that your understanding? Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you answer Mr. Prater's questions, please? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. You Good doing morning. okay today? Yes, right. sir. First thing I'd like to know is how old were you exactly when this offense occurred? I was exactly, um, I was 17 years old. Okay, and how close to your 18th birthday? Um, approximately a month. Okay. All right, that's that's one thing that when I made some notes here, I was kind of curious about because uh, I know that you were re-sentenced uh, to where you're eligible for parole, but had this occurred three weeks later, you wouldn't have had that opportunity. So because of that Supreme Court ruling, you were, uh, you, you did get lucky by three weeks 
uh, and so that that was a good thing. Uh, I, I read the file, and there was a lot of things in there, as you could, as you would know, and as I'm sure you're very familiar with. Some things that bothered me was the fact that uh, I know the contention is that the boyfriend uh, killed your mom, and not you. You were just there, but there was some money and VCRs and things like that stolen. Whose idea was that? Um, that was his idea. It was done after the fact, and he decided that he needed to take those things so he could sell them for money. Okay. And then, then I know these are difficult things to talk about because it's, I'm sure you want to put this out of your mind and, and don't want to go back over it, but it's the things I need to uh, clear up maybe in my mind is once once your mom was deceased, then you disposed of the body. Who, who's who who was leading the charge on this? Who was like, go get a trash bag, help me get her in a trash bag, that sort of thing. Um, that was what he basically he told me what to do and what to get, and I did comply with what he asked me to do. Okay. And I assume the cleaning up the crime scene also. Um, did you go and get the bleach or did he go and get it or what happened with that? Uh, he did. He did go and get it. Um, <clears throat> and basically, I remember him pouring. He poured the bleach in everywhere and he made the comment that um, if he could put the bleach on the blood that it would destroy the DNA and they wouldn't know if it was just one person's blood or more than one person. Okay. All right. And, uh, and then of course you disposed of, of the body and, and all that. And we know that. And then y'all went on the run and while you were actually on the run is when you turned 18, correct? In the three weeks or so that you were uh, on the lamb and headed to Mexico, you turned 18. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then you were caught and, and the rest of it is history. Once you've been incarcerated, I noticed that you you did you've done some really great things as far as your certificates and uh, all of that. How many certificates do you think you have? I didn't count them all, but I know there were a lot and I read each yeah. one of them. Somewhere around maybe 45. Okay. So you've taken good use of your time while you've been incarcerated. I have so tried, I, sir. I commend, you, I commend you for that. Uh, I really do. One thing I was troubled with was an incident in 2022 where you got into some kind of altercation. I see you're kind of shaking your head. You know where I'm going with this. Could you tell me about that? I, I know that you were you were disciplined for aggravated fighting, I believe is what it was. Uh, yes, sir. Um it was a situation that happened at the spur of the moment. I did not think before I acted. And it was a, a very unfortunate and it's something I really, really regret. Um, since then, I've actually taken a couple of classes that dealt with the fact that I should have asked for help instead of reacting so quickly, you know, um, I did not at that point did I did not think before I acted, but now I know that it doesn't cost anything just to stop for a minute before you do something. And that can completely prevent an unfortunate incident like this from happening. Okay, that's that's good words. But what actually happened? What made it aggravating? Um I really don't know why they said why they said it was aggravated fighting. I think because there was more than two people involved. I think if it was more than two people involved, they consider it aggravated or um, you have to have some kind of weapon or something. But I didn't have anything like that. Um, there were three people involved in this fight. So that's why they considered it aggravated. Because I'm normally in in crime business, you think of aggravated as with a weapon or whether serious injury or something like that. But in this case, 
Was there a weapon involved or serious injury? No, sir. There was just, there was no weapon. It was a, just a, what they would call a typical fight, but because it was involving three people instead of two, they labeled it as an aggravated. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's about all the questions that I have. And you've been in jail for how long? Um, almost 25. It'll be four much short of 25 years. Okay. All right. And that's all the questions that I have there, Chairman. Thank you. And, and so today, how old are you? I am 42 years old. And you're, um, we refer to your co-defendant as your, your boyfriend? He, yes, yes ma'am. He was at the time. Yes, ma'am. How long has you and he been in a relationship? Um... Uh, about approximately like six to eight months. Um, Warden Thomas, is there anything you uh, can tell us about Ms. Johnson? Yeah, she is a um, medium custody offender. She has um, kind of like Mr. Prater had mentioned, just participated in quite um, a lot of different programs here, um, whether they were awarded CTRP credits or not. So I think that's something good to note that, you know, she was willing to participate in the class, whether there was some good time credits awarded. Um, she has completed MRT and thinking for a change. Uh, she has a low risk score. Um, she also participates in lifers and Toastmasters. So no real issues other than, you know, we had that hiccup that we kind of talked about with 2022 fight um, really since 2017, you know, have not really had any issues or anything. So. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, at this time, we'll hear from the folks who want to speak in support. Um, first, we'll hear from the parole project. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Um, parole project is, is prepared uh, to offer Ms. Johnson uh, long-term support. Um, we understand that, you know, at, as a juvenile, uh, when she was arrested at age 17, uh, and the length of time that she spent, um, that she's going to need some transition services. Obviously, the world has changed, and Parole Project will provide those things. We'll provide peer mentorship, uh, which essentially is, is a coach to help her uh, through the, the transition process. We'll make sure she has you know, all her documentation, that she's connected to healthcare services. We'll make sure that uh, she receives full programming. Uh, that will include financial uh, literacy, technology. Obviously, the technology gap is going to be significant. Um, but not only that, uh, goal setting, uh, practical applications, consumer skills, um, how not s simple things, you know, just how to live in today's world, uh, including uh, we'll be providing her transitional housing for as long as needed. Um, so we want this board to know the parole project is 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 prepared to give her full support. Thank you. Uh, I don't see uh, where any <clears throat> there are any other speakers here in support. So we'll hear next from the opposition. First, Ms. Renata, we have two um, that are here. Okay, uh, who are they, please? Linda Bud. Okay, and who's the other second speaker? Bernie Rose Coven. Okay, well, go ahead, uh, Ms. Landa, go ahead and tell us what you'd like us to hear. I'm sorry, it wasn't marked on my sheet. I didn't realize you had wanted to speak. Um, okay, well, good morning. My name is Linda Freddy Butts. I am Thea's aunt on her daddy's side. Uh, I am here today to support Thea. I would like to thank the parole board for giving her this chance. Um, over the years, I have gotten to know Thea very well. I know that... I need to up. Can you see me? <laughs> I've gotten to know Thea very well. I know that um, she is bright, intelligent, friendly, and outgoing person. She tries to maintain a positive mental attitude. She is a well-adjusted, mature person. Um, her seminary training has given her a strong foundation in what a Christian is. She is a true believer and lives it in her daily life. Uh, I am so proud of Thea's 
faith, strength, and determination to make the most of her situation. She has proved that she has a genuine desire to be helpful to her fellow inmates and want to continue helping them when she gets out. Um, uh, she was chosen to teach a seminary class. Um, a, I'm sorry, a safe serve class and has been very helpful in teaching and encouraging and having um, to her students. She really, you know, she really um, cares about her students. She wants to do everything that she can to help them. Uh, if they're having trouble, she she really jumps in and helps them. She tells me because we speak almost daily, you know, daily. Um, and she wants to help others. Um, and when when she gets out, um, she's taken um, courses to um, for, for teaching, encouraging, and um, classes for self improvement and to help others. I I have been standing by Thea for twenty four years spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. I will be here for her in every way I can. All of our family will stand with her. <clears throat> I developed a relationship uh, uh, with uh, a Christine Johnson. That's uh, Thea's, Thea's grandmother. Um, before, uh, before, um, um, Thea's grandmother before she got sick. I know that she would be here to support Thea if she was able to. She is in a nursing home. She has dementia. She doesn't know Thea anymore. Um, I'm asking that you show fairness and mercy to her request for parole. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your input. All right, next. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Charlene Rhodes. I'm Thea's cousin. Um, in the time I've known Thea, I mean, I've, I've been in her life as long as I've been alive. Um, but as I've gotten older, we have, we've, we've spoken pretty much on the weekly. We, we've connected, we bonded. She's one of the softest, sweetest people I've ever met. Uh, her soul is genuine and kind through and through. Um, me and my husband own a couple of local businesses where we live and in the future, after uh, her parole project would end, we are prepared to be able to help her get a job, have a place to live. We're always going to be there to help support her, you know, emotionally, financially, spiritually, in whatever way we can. Uh, my business partner owns apartments. We already have her on a list for that. Um, I own a cafe tea store that we need people who are really good and serve safe and know, but are really good with public health. So. You know, we're prepared to do whatever we have to do. We're a family and we stand together and we're strong. And we love her very, very much. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate that. Now, we we do have in the record for your information, Ben, uh, some other family members uh, have expressed opposition to uh, favorable consideration. Um, and that's that's in the record. Uh, we'll hear from uh, the opposition. Could we first hear from Larry Walker, please? My name is Larry Walters. I am the brother-in-law to Linda Kyle, who was viciously murdered. And by the guilty, they confessed. And here today, we hear that she has blame for others, but yet she did confess. She pleaded for life without parole, a little of the death sentence. She is very manipulative. She has been able to con as many people as I know go her way in various things when I knew her before all this happened. And as the, the verdict, the penalty was given, was justice being served. Today, I asked the board to consider holding fast that original verdict. Okay. Mr. Walker. Uh, Dwayne Walters. Excuse me. 
And with all this is coming out of that, and it's just totally just impacted my life. I even had to take off for Tuesday from my job because all those images that I saw, it's just, it floods. I see the coagulated blood. I see the drag marks. Me and my nephew found a piece of her brain that they put in a garbage bag. And she yet yeah, always blames others. And I know she was in on it. She is a person. And I, I beg the board this morning, please listen to the plea of a family that had to deal with this and still has to deal with it today. So please not lose. Thank you, ma'am. And Libby. Libby Johnson. Good morning. My name is Ruby Johnson, and Linda Kyle was my sister-in-law, my best friend. I was married to her brother Wayne, and she passed away on January 1st, where he would be with us today. But in 1999, our lives changed, my life changed. It was a horrible situation, and I knew with the results of what we were told that Linda suffered, she suffered dearly. And I just don't think her sister should be changed, she should stay where she's at. She's never showed remorse, and she just needs to be she's at. She destroyed our whole family, and we've never been the same since then. Thank you. Right. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Thea, is there anything you'd like to say before we, uh, we yes. hear from, from you, and then we'll hear from uh, your attorney, and then Mr. the DA's office will close it out for us. Yes, ma'am. There's not a day that has gone by that I don't carry this. And I don't deny the fact. And I take responsibility because it was my accident, my choices that caused it. I don't deny that. And I know I've hurt so many people. And I can't take that back and I wish I could. But I've done everything every day to try to walk and never be that person again. I was young and I was stupid and I was... <sighs> I've walked every day since then to let my mama's life that she lost be a banner for me to be the best person I can be no matter where I'm at, no matter who needs my help, no matter what I do. And I'm sorry it's not good enough. And I wish it was, but it's not. It'll never be. But as Mr. Brader said, you see that I've tried to take every class that was available. I've learned so much, and I learned... <laughs> the pain that I've caused is so large. And I've taken every chance to, every explanation in every class that has explained how much pain I have caused and, and how hurt and the different, not only physical, emotional, If I'm given the chance, 
I'm going to take every opportunity available to me to continuously move forward, listen to my mentors, ask for help, no matter what situation I get myself in, that I know that there are people that'll help me now where I didn't before. And I just thank the board for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I thank everybody that's here, everyone that's here. Thank you, Neil. Ms. Curtis. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Cindy Curtis and I'm a third year law student at LSU. I'm certified under Louisiana Supreme Court Rule 20, representing Ms. Thea Johnson uh, for her parole application. Thank you for this opportunity. The United States Supreme Court in Miller v. Alabama held that juvenile offenders are fundamentally different from adult offenders. Specifically, the court um, found that juveniles have the biggest capacity to grow, to mature, to change, and to one day reenter society. Um, Ms. Johnson is unrecognizable from who she was, a teenage girl, almost 25 years ago. At the age of 17, while still in high school, a 31-year-old man um, found a vulnerable high schooler to latch on to. Ms. Johnson was in a position where she was consumed by that man. He used um, tactics like over-flattery to win over her trust, and then as soon as he built her trust, he used that trust to manipulate her by moving into her room, being with her in the car at all times. Ms. Johnson was consistently tired and exhausted and he was constantly calling the shots and she felt that she was in a position that she could not say no. And she felt vulnerable. But Ms. Johnson is not that teenage girl anymore. Now at 42, she has committed herself to self-growth by taking as many classes as possible, she has close to 50 certificates through all the different programs that she has participated in. And she has found faith in God through different programs like Kairos and the Exodus Training Center, which she has found through her daily life gives her hope and gives her courage that she can change, that she can become stronger from who she was at the age of 17. And through classes like moral recognition therapy and thinking for a change, Ms. Johnson has grown into a woman that is independent. She's no longer codependent like she was at 17. She knows how to set healthy boundaries, which she was unable to do when she was still a high schooler. And she has learned to acknowledge her emotions and process them and to react properly. And I know the committee today has raised concerns about Ms. Johnson's most recent write-up. Um, however, Ms. Johnson recognizes that she made a mistake that day and she deeply regrets it. And she has taken courses to work on what led to that um, altercation by taking Living in Balance, Sister's Keeper, and Life's Healing Choices. And she has learned now from that mistake. And further, 75% of her write-ups were in the first decade, and 96% of her write-ups were in the first 15 years of her incarceration. So only 4%, two of her write-ups have occurred in the last decade, which has shown how much Ms. Johnson has grown through her time in incarceration and how much effort she's put into herself to grow and become a better person. And Ms. Johnson was given a low Tiger score in December of 2023, which occurred after the um, write-up in 2022. And she was, it stated that she has a low risk for recidivism. And so that write-up specifically does not define who Ms. Johnson is and that she is not a risk to society and she has grown. And beyond just focusing on herself while incarcerated, Ms. Johnson has found a passion for serving others by participating in community service events like Serenity Gardens, Autism Walk, Children's Extravaganza. But her favorite way of serving others is by teaching. And she's found that through being a surf safe instructor and a CTE tutor. And many of her peers look up to her and find her to be the shoulder that they lean on. And finally, um, uh, Honorable Committee, Ms. Johnson, has a strong reentry plan. She is going to be a long-term resident at the parole project where they will provide her a case manager where she will have mentors that can guide her through that process where she will have housing, they will help her with employment. 
And she also plans to complete her associate's degree because through Ashland University, she has two years if granted parole to finish her degree because education's always been one of her top priorities. And for all these reasons and reasons articulated at this hearing and in the brief submitted on Ms. Johnson's behalf, Ms. Johnson respectfully requests that this honorable committee grant her parole with any conditions the committee deems appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your brief. It was very thorough. It was very helpful. Um, we'll go uh, call Mr. Terrell, the DA's office, to close it out for us, please. Did you, want, did you want me to speak first before Mr. Terrell? I can't I can't hear anybody. Tara, you're on you're on mute still. Can can y'all hear me? Hmm. We can hear we can't hear Mr. Terrell. Okay, can 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 I, can I go before him? We're going to let him him uh close it out for us. Okay. Is that is is that is are you Mr. Derek Johnson? Yes, ma'am. I I I'll work for Mr. Terrell. Let's just let the ADA close it. Can you hear us now? Yes, we can. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? Yes, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, lady and gentlemen, and ladies and gentlemen in the audience. Philip Terrell on behalf of the state of Louisiana and the victims in this matter. <clears throat> I'm really glad that uh, that they is, is taking advantage of all the opportunities to better herself provided by the prison system. I'm glad that she's had uh, some benefits, but let's not forget why the is in prison. The soft, sweet person described by her cousin pled guilty to the worst crime under Louisiana law. She pled guilty to first degree murder. The family support described by the two ladies who spoke on her behalf, one of them, her cousin, who said she's known her her entire life. Let's think about that a minute. She's got family support. Well, the person she murdered, the person she took part in taking life was the very person who gave her life. The very person who gave her life, her mother. Life's not a movie. Kind of reminds me of natural born killers. Life's not a movie. Our actions have consequences. The consequence of Thea's action had devastating consequences to all the victims who came before y'all and spoke devastating consequences that can't be erased that they have to live with every day they have to live with those things for the rest of their lives day in and day out part of criminal sentences part of life sentences have to do with retribution part of those have to do with paying our bills that's what he is doing now I'm glad that she's able to help some people in the prison system. I'm glad she's growing and learning. I have to point out, as the sheriff pointed out earlier, she had a hiccup. She got in a fight. She's not ready to get out. She's not ready for parole. The victims who spoke to y'all have an interest. They have an interest in Thea staying in prison for the crime she committed killed her mother. She murdered her mother. The state of Louisiana and the victims stand before this board today and ask you not to grant her parole because it's the right thing to do. She pled guilty to first degree murder, the crime of murdering her mother. 
Thank you very much. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, is the panel prepared to vote? Mm -hmm. Mr. Crater? Okay, my vote uh, is to deny this, this uh, uh, parole. Uh, I don't want you to give up hope. There will be a chance that you'll come back to us. I want there to be um, I want there to be longer time between your latest discipline that you made a bad decision. I mean, that's what started this whole thing was a bad decision. So I'd like to see some more time. Um, and I also took into consideration besides that, the age, you missed it by three weeks or we wouldn't even be here. And so that was pretty close to what I'd call maybe the not legal definition of age of accountability, but by law it was. So your age, when it occurred, you were almost 18, uh, the recent fight, and then of course the victim impact. So my, my vote would be to, at this particular time, deny your request. Mr. Teller? Uh, I commit all the services and classes you've taken. Uh, the choices we choose, the choices we have to live with. I agree with my colleague uh, at this time to deny. All right, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, my vote is the same. You know, I, I, I appreciate the hard work that you put in. You know, the hiccup that we are calling a hiccup, the fight in 2022 is concerning to me about your uh, capacity for decision making. That was after you took the thinking for change, which was supposed to help you learn to make better decisions. So you still have some more work to do. I don't think you're quite ready. Um, today, your parole application has been denied. Good luck to you. Thank you, Mr. Lancaster. Thank you, Ms. Curtis. Thanks to everybody for participating. Thank, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think that concludes our business and LCIW. We're going to sign off at 942. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you.
All right, good morning. Committee on Parole is reconvening. Today's Monday, April 1st, 2024. It's 9.59 a.m. and we are at Iberville, is that right? Iberville Parish Jail. Good morning, my name is Cheryl Renazzi, serving as the chairman of today's parole panel. My colleagues on the panel seated to my left is Mr. Steve Prater, to my right, Mr. Chuck Matillas. Uh, would the staff there at Iberville please introduce yourself for the record? Good morning. This is this is Joe Dupont. I'm I'm Coy Simpson's attorney, and Mr. Simpson is present, and uh, uh, Bill Parish Warden is in the next room. Okay, great. Thank you. And you said you're Mr. Dupont. Yes, ma'am. All right. So I'm gonna. Uh, I can get to the right page. I'm gonna read the allegations against Mr. Simpson and ask him to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. We'll have some questions. And at the end, we'll ask him for his statement, if he has one, and then ask you to close it out. Is that okay with you, that process? That's fine. That's fine. So, Mr. Simpson, you're here for a revocation decision this morning. You ready to proceed? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Ms. Renata. Good morning. I'm going to uh, read the allegations, ask you to enter your plea of guilty or not guilty, and then we'll talk about it, Okay. Okay. So you're accused of violating conditions of your parole, specifically condition number four, you engaged in criminal activity as evidenced by your arrest June 9, 2021 by the Louisiana State Police for possession of a firearm by a felon, two counts, illegal possession of stolen firearms, two counts, in possession with the intent to distribute cocaine, <clears throat> possession of a firearm with a controlled dangerous substance, and improper lane change. On November 9, 2023, you pled guilty to possession of marijuana and received a sentence of a $100 fine in court costs in five days parish jail. All other charges were dismissed. So how do you plead to violating that instance of condition number four? Not guilty. Not guilty. Okay. Then we have another one, condition number four, which states you also engaged in criminal activity as evidenced by your arrest March 13, 2023, for taking contraband to or from a penal institution in possession with intent to distribute methamphetamines by the Iberville Parish Sheriff's Department. These charges were not crossed on November 9, 2024. How do you plead to that violation? Not guilty. Not guilty. We have condition number five, which states you were in possession of firearms as evidenced by your arrest June 9, 2021, for possession of a firearm by a felon, two counts, illegal possession of stolen firearms, two counts, and possession of a firearm to control dangerous substance. During the search of the vehicle that you were driving on that day, June 9, 2021, uh, per the police report from the Louisiana State Police, the faceplate of the center console, which houses the transmission shift knob and cup holders, was removed. Underneath the face plate, face plate in a neutral void of the vehicle center console were two semi-automatic pistols. Pistols were later determined to be 9mm Ruger SR-1911, a Smith & Wesson uh, 40 caliber. An NCIC inquiry later revealed both firearms had reported stolen. How do you to violate condition number five? Lorenzo verification. I don't know what that's not guilty. And then we have condition number 10, which yeah. says you have made no payments toward your supervision fees and currently $1,953 in rent. How do you plead, sir? Not guilty. Okay. Well, let's address that first. So tell us, you say you're not guilty to being behind on your fees? You are behind, but you were doing community oh. service. Explain that to me. Well, I'm, I was behind Ms. Ms. Renasi because I, was, I wasn't employed. I wasn't working in it, it because due to the COVID situation. And I was doing community service. Okay, that explains it. Okay, well, let's go back up to uh, the, the 2021 uh, charges with the firearms. Tell us what happened. Tell me about the ministers. Oh. Uh, would you like Mr. Simpson to address it first or, or me? <laughs> if you like. Mr. Uh, Dupont, 
Yeah, yeah let, let me maybe I'll go first. Just I want to ask y'all, did y'all have the opportunity to read the report from Chad Bordelon? I don't know that I have. He was uh he he came and conducted a preliminary hearing here at the jail, collected evidence and issued a report. Y'all didn't yes. get to see it. We did. Yes, we had that. All right. All right. Well, if you if you notice, uh count four and five are both from the same incident. And on the second page, um, you can see where um, Mr. Simpson was participating with a community service program through uh, Ms. Chapman uh, with the peer ministry group. And on the day of that incident, he had written in a van with other individuals that were participating in that community service uh, that day. Uh, they rode in the van from New Orleans to Angola, and then from Angola, they went to Baton Rouge. Uh, and while in Baton Rouge, Ms. Chapman, who was uh, facilitating that program, asked Mr. Simpson if he would ride with Rondell Smith to Rain, Louisiana, to drop off some COVID supplies at this first Baptist church. Uh, so... Had she not asked him to ride with Mr. Smith, who was uh, driving his own vehicle, he had never ended up in that vehicle that day to begin with. Uh, Rondell Smith asked um, asked Mr. Simpson to drive because he said he was tired, uh, uh, just wanted someone else to drive. And that's when they got stopped. And that's how Mr. Simpson ended up in that vehicle. Uh, and, and all of the uh, contraband, the guns, the drugs, all of that was hidden within the vehicle. None of it was in plain view. The only, the only thing that was, would have been in plain view would have been a small amount of marijuana, uh, which Mr. Simpson ultimately pled to possession of marijuana. The remaining charges, accompanying charges, were all dismissed uh, based primarily on what I just presented to the three of y'all, that he had no knowledge, and it was by chance that he ended up in that vehicle. Mr. Rondell Smith did plead guilty, and in his guilty plea, uh, confirmed that that Mr. Simpson had no knowledge of the, the contraband or the guns that was in the vehicle, and exonerated him on those charges. And uh, that that being said, uh, Coy, do you have anything to add on that um, as far as how that transpired? It was a vape pen, Mr. Knox. It wasn't marijuana itself it was a vape pen that tested positive for marijuana which i bought from the the truck stop they said it was cbd but in the toxicology report it said the cbd level was high enough for me to be charged with misdemeanor possession of marijuana right by guilty to that right yeah. And I, I would add that I recommended he plead to the misdemeanor marijuana because I was in discussions with his parole officer at the time who indicated that a misdemeanor plea uh, likely would not result in a, in a revocation. So I recommended he do that based on the totality of the circumstances with all of these felony charges pending. And it was an easy way to be done. He had been in jail for quite some time by the on, on a hold by the time we, we entered the plea and and I think you can see the the sentence of the court was five days Paris jail, which I mean he had been in jail quite some time and that covered him. And we felt that that would, you know, take care of his parole issue based on my discussions with his uh parole officer at the time. Okay. Can you address now the, the contraband? Yeah, first, I, I'll let Mr. Simpson go after me, but uh, on the contraband, there were multiple people charged with that incident, which occurred here at Inville Parish Jail. Uh, Mr. Simpson was working as a trustee. He would go out with a group of other guys, and they would pick up trash on the side of the road and, and that type of stuff. stuff. And uh, that, there was some contraband that got introduced into the jail. Multiple people got charged, but at the end of the day, the district attorney's office didn't feel that the charges against Mr. Simpson were warranted uh, based on a couple of the co-defendants exonerating Mr. Simpson, given written statements that, that he had no knowledge of, of the contraband, and those charges ultimately were dismissed uh, in, in their entirety against Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, you want to say that? 
I was a part of a, a litter abatement crew, and our job was to go out around the parish and pick up trash. And on the morning of the incident, one of the other guys who was arrested on a charge with me, he asked me to grab some cigarettes and a lighter for him. And I grabbed what I believe thought was some cigarettes and the lighter, and I gave it to him. And immediately, once the, the, the authorities, and well, it was the warden and uh, Detective Moore came, I let him know what my role was in it. And I told him I didn't know nothing about it. And when they asked me, I told him everything I knew. And like Mr. Boylan put in this summary, Detective Moore let him know that I fully cooperated with the investigation. I had no knowledge of that at all. How many people's on that crew? It was four of us. Four. So everybody got in trouble? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I would also note that that there was another individual that wasn't part of that crew that was charged, and that was the, the female who deposited the narcotics, and she wrote a detailed statement stating that she didn't know Mr. Simpson, he had no knowledge of it, and it was coordinated between her and some other inmate. He just, uh, I'm sure y'all hear this a lot, but he was in the wrong place at the wrong time on two occasions. The first one, if he wasn't asked by the ministry to drive this Smith guy, he's never in the vehicle. On this one, he was trusted enough at the jail to be a trustee and have the freedom to, to go out on the work crew. And, and, and there's been no other complaints. And I, I think uh, I think there's been some positive statements made. I don't know if they were in the report by, by our, actually our sheriff and other members of our law enforcement that, you know, Mr. Simpson just, that was bad circumstance but other than that he's been a model model inmate here and uh, of course he's been here almost three years now on this on this hold um and uh you know i hopefully i'll take all of this into consideration but had he not been in a vehicle with mr smith had he not been with the guys that were coordinating this this contraband issue we we wouldn't be here today thank you um, I didn't recognize uh, your godmother, Miss Harris, and she wants to speak on your behalf. Miss Dorothy, would you like to say something now? Yes, ma'am. All right, go ahead. Greetings. Thank you all. Uh, I've been in court license. Carl was in elementary school, and his life has never been easy. He, I mean... His mother loved him dearly. She did her best she can with, with them. His grandmother, grandparents practically raised him. But his mother, no disrespect to you, Coy, was a woman of the streets and uh, was prostituting. And she died from that, that sickness because of, of that. She ended up dying with AIDS. And I'm sorry, Coy, no disrespect. And so his grandparents were older people that practically practically raised him and had him in a part of the church house and, and stuff like this here. But Coy was young and he his his parents was dead, his mother and his father. His father, I don't know too much of him, but wasn't basically in his life, but I know his mother. And they uh, died before he was even sentenced to go to penitentiary at a young age. A child at 17 years old had to go to penitentiary to grow to be a man. He learned to be a man in penitentiary. I was in the courthouse the day that he was sentenced for his time to go to penitentiary with my uh, now deceased son. So uh, they're like brothers, and that's my godson. And uh, he he never had that guide, that proper guidance when he came home and stuff like that. He came home. Thank, thinking he was coming home to a lot of love and the world changed, the people changed and he 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 just didn't have no place to stay stably. He, his daughter, she had him with him but because she had a firearm, her, her, the parole officer wouldn't let Coy stay with his, his daughter and he, he had no job, you know, no financial income, period. He wasn't put into no type of placement or in, in to t no type of program to really help him. The parole officer or uh, the city in New Orleans, they didn't really give Coy the proper help he need. Coy really need mental help as well because a, a, a young child, a, 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 a young boy going into penitentiary and doing 20, 20 something years as a boy. I mean, he, he had, hadn't even developed as a man when he went into penitentiary. And when he came home, he 
I, I, I feel like he felt the world was going to be the same and a lot of love was going to be exhibited and it wasn't, you know, people make promises to you and they didn't. I had cancer. So it was, I was limited to what I can even do for him because I have to stay with my son and stuff like that because of my sickly situation. And I, I, you know, I believe if Coy can get the proper help that he need, you know, he can come out here and be a productive, productive citizen if you allow him to have one opportunity because his whole life has been full of drama. Like I say, when he came home, his grandparents, everybody mainly was dead. Oh, he had a sibling, a brother, but they were raised in two different mental states because he was, the brother was raised with his dad parents and Carl was raised with his grandmother. So the brother have a or you know a productive life, productive life, but Coy has they have their minds are two mental different things and Coy, he a good Harris, person. Harris, can you wrap it up for us, please, ma'am? I'm sorry to interrupt. We're okay. What well, I'm just talking. saying, okay. What well, I'm just saying, I pray that you all would uh, hear me and listen and give him the opportunity to, to come out here in this world and be a protected, be, be protected in life and give him an opportunity to really live a life as a man. And another thing I would like to say, his daughter okay. is trying, his daughter is trying to get in and she can't get in. She's trying to register to get in. She can't get in. Okay. Well, thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your remarks. I'm sorry she's having trouble uh, getting in. So, uh, Mr. Simpson, did you hear your, your daughter was trying to join, but she's having trouble. She wants to be here and, and uh, speak in your behalf, but we're going to move on. So, look, uh, you've been in jail almost three years. In June, it'll be three years. Mr. DuPont did a good job explaining uh, the violations I'm a little concerned about the the, uh, the marijuana, and I'm concerned about where will you go if if you're not revoked today? Tell me what your plan would be. Where would you go? Well, for one, I I, I finally have a chance to get some employment through the sheriff. The sheriff he introduced me to somebody at a plant called Formosa in Baton Rouge. They don't they don't worry about criminal background, and I know how to paint. You know what I'm saying? And uh, well, I, well, so where would you live? I contacted some people from the parole project. They're going to hook me up with with uh, a place to stay, as well as the first 72. They told me if either one I can go to until they find an apartment, uh, an affordable apartment for me, I can sleep there at the place. They got a little, a little program called a couch. Until the bed come open in the back, it's six beds. If all six beds are full, you Not sleep. The first 72? First the couch program, ma'am. You about the first seventy two with the couch? Yeah, yes, ma'am. The first seventy two hours. New Orleans. Yes, ma'am. New Orleans. Oh, uh, it's it's on Gravity Street. I know it's right by the. It's not far from the courthouse. It's right near the jail. Yeah, I, I know where it is. But, so yeah. you want to go to New Orleans and you want to work for for the I'd rather, I'd rather I'd rather go to the parole project in Baton Rouge because it'd be closer to the job. The, the plant for Mosa that he has an opportunity to possibly go work at is, is here in this area. With, with That's what I thought. Better... That's why 72 is throwing me off a little right. bit. No, I'm saying either I have either option for as for a housing plan with either or. But I would rather the, the people in Baton Rouge at the parole project because it gave me a chance to, to, to be closer to, to Formosa. And I, I already have the OSHA training and I don't need a tweak. <laughs> Listen, so who did you talk to at the parole project? To, uh, through, I talked to uh, Anthony. Anthony? Yeah. All right. Anything else y'all want to say to us before we vote? Uh, no, I would just like to uh, point out that I believe Mr. Simpson had been on parole for about three years prior to this incident, which he's being held on. And he was trouble free, had, had no, no arrest or anything like that. And uh, clearly, he got caught up in a, a, a bad uh, circumstance uh, traveling with this Rondell Smith fella, which resulted in why we're here today. I think I think uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed if you give him uh, another opportunity here. Uh, Mr. Simpson, before we started, asked me to uh, throw this out there as well. If, if you all aren't uh, completely comfortable with lifting the hold all together, uh, he wanted to know if y'all might consider, but maybe a, a six-month work release sanction, if that if that made you more comfortable, where he could, you know, get get his feet on the ground a little better before getting out. But uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed with uh, Mr. Smith and with Mr. Uh, Simpson in the future. All right. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Dupont. Look, I'm ready to vote. I uh, I did have work release on my on my mind. I think that he needs a little more uh, help to try to. I like his parole project plan, but usually when they're uh, supportive, they'll usually be here or let us know. I don't have anything in the record that confirms that. I agree. Baton Rouge is probably better for you than New Orleans, Mr. Simpson. Uh, and I do note that in the record, you 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 had been on supervision for a little while and you had no other violations. So I'd be willing in lieu of to give you. Yes, sure. Go ahead. I wonder if I can get a kid. Yeah. And I didn't know she was. Go ahead and ask you a question. Mr. Prater has a question before I vote. I was a little bit concerned about the 2021 arrest. Uh, and you say you were taking COVID supplies. Is that what it was? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, but the police report says you told the trooper y'all were delivering Bibles. It was and Bibles. It was Bibles, food. It was uh, 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 non-perishable items that people from Louisiana, inmates from Louisiana State Penitentiary had donated. Yes, but there were no Bibles there. But it was it was for the healthy. And that maybe I can help clarify it a little. Let maybe. me finish, please. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. According to the police report, there were no Bibles in there, and you said y'all were delivering Bibles. The trooper says it's an unusual time of night to be delivering Bibles. That you didn't know where the church was. You told him you were a minister. Uh, and then you told him it was a rental car, and it seems strange now. You tell him it was your brother's car, and it turned out to be when they said it wasn't your brother, you said a brother in Christ. And it's it just I'm confused about this 2021 deal. It seems like even with your criminal record of armed robbery and other things, that now all of a sudden. All, all of a sudden, bad things keep happening to you, but they're not your responsibility. And then the perish, the, the per, non-perishable items that you're delivering turns out to be cocaine that's sealed inside green bean cans. But I find that hard to believe that you didn't quite know about any of these drugs, yet you had marijuana with you. So you're willing to go with the marijuana, but not the stolen guns or the green bean cans full of cocaine. Could you could you help me, sir, figure this out? Uh, Mr. Simpson, explain, explain to this gentleman how that day went as far as point A to point B to point C. You started in New Orleans on a bus with other individuals, right? All right go through that whole chain of events. From, from total community action where I was serving my uh, community service, TCA, we went from there on a van to LSP to the front gate. We loaded all the supplies up on the van. We went from the van to Living Worth in Bad Rouge. I want to say it's somewhere on Sherwood. And from there, we bagged all of the, the bags up that had the, the boxes up that had to go to the churches where we had to deliver to. We went to one church in, in Lafayette and two in Rain. One I remember for sure in Rain was. One I remember for sure in Rain was St. Joseph Catholic Church. I remember that one for sure. But Coy, you were riding on the bus for the first few stops, right? Yes, sir. When did when were you asked to ride, get in the vehicle and ride with Rondell Smith? In, in Baton Rouge, when we got back to Living Word, when we was boxing all the supplies up, Miss Chapman and Mr. DeLone asked me to ride with him because it was mostly older people and, and they had a lot of women. And me and him was the maybe like the two biggest, the two strongest to, to lift the boxes. But you didn't you didn't start the day with Rondell Smith. No, sir. You rode on the bus. At some point, they asked you if you would continue on with him. Yes, sir. So had they not asked you to ride with him, you'd have never, never been in the vehicle. Never been in vehicle. Uh, and the vehicle was a rented vehicle. It turned out it was rented to his wife, I believe, huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and 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 the contraband that that gentleman was just asking you about. Was all was was all that hidden in different parts of the vehicle? Yeah, they say they found it somewhere. They had to take, remove something from the truck, like the face. They had to 
unscrew it or something like that. Yeah, the report stated that the guns were, you had to disassemble the vehicle to, to be able to see the guns. And I think these green bean cans may have been in the, in the trunk or they were concealed behind the wall of the trunk, if I remember correctly. But they wouldn't have been visible to anybody unless you knew they were there. Uh, uh, hopefully that helps clarify it to some extent. If there's any more questions, I think he'd be happy to address them. Did you know this fellow that wife rented this car? Did you know him previously? No, sir. You never met him at the TCA meeting. Hmm. What were you on parole for? A robbery that happened in 1995. Yes, you had served how long? Uh, 23 years and two days. What was your total sentence? 80 flat years, but I had it commuted to 40 when the when the Fourth Circuit found that it was excessive and illegal. Okay. Did anybody get hurt in this armed robbery? Not at all. It, it it was it was more of a of a fight that turned into a chain snatching and okay. Okay. All right. Thanks for uh, that clarification, Mr. Simpson. My vote today will be in lieu of revocation to send you to a six month work release program. And I want to do that because I need you to have a more firm, solid plan with the parole project. And hopefully, we can, you know, the work release will be able to secure that job with Formosa to get your feet on the ground with them. Um, Thank you, Mr. Knox. I would also add special condition after you're released, fully released, uh, and you're still on supervision, that you do have a substance abuse evaluation and you comply with anything that may be recommended in terms of treatment. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Crater. Okay, so just for clarification, he's going to stay in jail. For six months. In for Russell. six months in work mm -hmm. release. And the sheriff also has got him a job when he gets out, correct? So the sheriff is in favor of this. Right. That's so, our understanding. That's our understanding. Six months will help him get his uh, parole project, reentry and housing plan. Okay. I, I'll, I'll, I'll concur with that, but I want you to, to if you can see the screen, look at my eyes because, you know, I'm hard to convince about some things, and I'm not, don't think that I'm convinced about everything I heard today. All right? Rest assured, I ain't that easy. Yes. Thank you. Now, good luck with your work release. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Mr. Chilly? I agree with uh, Mr. Renatz. Uh The training and uh, get on a work release program. All right. Thank That's you. the plan. Now, of course, Sensor, we don't want to see you again. No, not at all, Mr. Nelson. All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DuPont, thank you very much. That concludes our business at Everville. We're going to sign off. It's 1028. That'll work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hey, that's who even convinced uh, one guy who was. Uh, one, oh, I took your best.
Good morning. Committee on Parole is reconvening. We're at David Wade Correctional Center on Monday, April 1st, 2024. It's 10.35 a.m. Uh, my name is Cheryl Renatza, serving as chairman of today's parole panel. Uh, my colleagues on the panel, to my left, Mr. Steve Prater, and to my right, Mr. Chucky Tillis. Would staff, Warren, would you introduce yourself and have your staff introduce themselves, please? Good morning. Morning. Mr. Shelby Dozier, Warden. Not been here. Uh, Tammy Wynn. Danny Hinshaw. No. Is that everybody? Okay, Mr. Mr. Knight, good morning. Would you re restate your name for us and tell us your DOC number, please? No, Knight, 614 All right, uh, Mr. Knight, I, let me just read some identifying information and ask you to confirm that. <clears throat> So you are Dalton Knight, DOC 614897. You're classified as the first felony offender. You're currently serving a seven-year sentence for indecent behavior with a juvenile. You were sentenced originally in September of 2013. Um, and, and then you were you were afforded probation. You were uh, revoked in May of 2019. Uh, so your parole eligibility date was determined to be September, uh, excuse me, February 23rd, 2020. You don't earn good time, so your full term release date is October 24th, 2024. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, your case this morning has been assigned to Mr. Tillis. Would you answer his questions? How are you doing, Mr. Knight? How long have you been inside? Next uh, May will be five years. Mm -hmm. I've been here four years and uh, uh, ten months. Have you taken any classes or training since you've been there? I've completed all phase, four phases of the uh, Louisiana Tech class: uh, anger management, uh, reentry, uh, in the uh, uh, AA in a, a program now. Do you feel that you you've been helped? Sir. Do you feel that you've been helped? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, is there anything you do differently when you get out? No, I, 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 yeah, I just about just about figured out everything that needs to be done, what I've done wrong, and what I couldn't what I couldn't be doing. And if you get out, what are your plans? I plan to go uh, back to Texas to live and, and, and uh, uh, resume my social security and, and uh, minister to homeless people on the street. Any further questions? Okay, in 2013, you got put in jail for for this offense, for the original offense. And then you got seven years. Evidently, some a lot of that was suspended. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How much time did you spend at that time? 14 months. Okay, and then you got out, and then you were revoked and put back in. I was on probation for uh, five years, and I had done four and a half years and got revoked. Okay. But the four and a half years wasn't inside the jail, though, right? No. Okay, so so you got some pretty good breaks to begin with, correct? Correct. Okay, and if you are given parole today, if you aren't given parole today, you're going to be getting out anyway in six or eight months, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So you, so you're wanting, you're wanting another break. Now you got to break it sentencing. You got to, you screwed up. You got to break it when you got sentenced, and then you screwed up again. And now you want us to give you a chance again. 
just for the benefit of getting out some five months, four months early, correct? Uh, it, that and health problems too, you know. Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't have anything. Why were you revoked in 19? Well, why were you revoked in 2019? Why did they revoke you? They said it was for drugs, but I didn't know. They want to drug my sister because I don't do drugs, never have done drugs. Hmm. Was it for failure to report because, and you moved without permission, and there were some nude photos on your phone, and you failed to do or comply with the sex offender treatment? I had done all that. I mean, what, what reason I didn't report? I was in the hospital the day they, I got out the day they arrested me. And I had tried to notify a parole officer, a probation officer, and never could get a hold of them. All right. Well, the record does say something different. I noticed that uh, lately you've been in and out of the hospital. What, do you have a, a serious medical issue? Uh, yes, a heart trouble. Mm -hmm. All right. Warden, is there anything you um, want to add? Um, Mr. Knight's been here since 2019. He's received one write-up. He did, I think his uh, summary reflects he was in phase three, but he has completed the sex offender treatment program. Uh, in regards to his medical issues, he's had eight stents in his heart and he has a previous leg injury that he still has some issues with. But um, as far as his rule violation um, reports, I mean, he doesn't really have any uh, significant issues here. He hasn't been any disciplinary issue here while he's been housed here at David Wade. Thank you. That's helpful. Mr. Knight, is there anything you'd like to say to us before we vote? No, it, you know, it, if granted parole, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll do everything I have to to, to uh, stay out of there, and I won't be back at the cure. Good to hear. Okay, I think we're prepared to vote, Mr. Tillis. I think that uh, I'm going to have to deny it. Mr. Crater? I'll deny it. Um, if you need a... Yeah, I'll deny it. I don't think that it's worth the risk uh, to the citizens of Louisiana to allow you out early at all, and I hope when you do get out, you go to Texas and your health's okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Knight, I, I do concur with my colleagues. You failed probation for reasons other than what you stated, so my vote today is to deny your parole. You'll have a full-term date a little later this year. We wish you well. Good luck. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Yes, for not, sir. Yes, sir. Showing, um, one, of, one of our offenders that was supposed to be on the docket today, I think it's showing at Jefferson, but he's he's currently here. I'm not sure if they were aware of that. Okay. Thank you. He's still there. Yeah. Cheers.
All right, we are we are back in session, and let's see, Mr. Young. Well, do you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. Name is Dwayne Young, three four six six two two. All right, Mr. Young. Um, <clears throat> Let me, uh, my name is Cheryl Renazza. This is Mr. Steve Prater to my left, Mr. Chuck Tillis to my right. Uh, let me recognize the folks who have joined us today. We have here in support, uh, Ms. Val, Ms. Valley, how do you pronounce her last name? Valle. Valle. Ms. Katina Valle, your fiance and the parole project is here as well. In opposition, we have uh, Joseph. Rochelle and uh, the district attorney's office represented by Mr. Derek Johnson. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Young, I'm gonna read some identifying information into the record. I asked you to verify that information. Your case has been assigned to me, so I'll take the lead on the interview. Once we finished with our questions, we'll ask for the warden's input, and then we'll hear from the folks who are here in support, and uh, then we'll hear from the opposition. <clears throat> At some point in there, I'll let you make a closing statement, okay? okay that's right. So, uh, Mr. Young, you're classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving a life sentence, uh, having been convicted or resentenced in July of 2018 for second degree murder. Uh, you were resentenced for moving the parole restriction, I believe. Uh, you have a parole eligibility date, which was determined to be April 5th, 2019. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Mr. Young, how old are you, sir? How long have I served? How old are you? 47. And yes, how long have you served? 30 years. Okay. So, you've served 30 years of a life sentence, right? Yes, ma'am. And as I said, you, you are classified as a first offender. I want you to tell us what happened. Why uh, Mr. Peter Rochelle lost his life. You tell us. On the night of December the 17th, 1993, I was out and I was selling drugs when Mr. Rochelle and Mr. Joseph Rochelle, they approached in a vehicle, uh, they were trying to score crack cocaine. Mr. Rachel exited the vehicle and he tasted the crack and he bit off half of it. On his return to the vehicle, he showed me, he just raised his shirt and he showed me a weapon. And from that, I responded. I pulled the weapon that I had and I shot Mr. Rashid. And he lost his life. Yes, ma'am. So, <clears throat> so you've been in jail for 30 years after committing murder. Tell us what, how you've spent the last 30 years. What have you been doing? Over the last 30 years, I've invested a lot of time into educating myself and trying to become a better me to understand that the biggest mistake in, our, in my life, I made it on that night. And I didn't want that mistake to define me the remainder of my life. So I knew that I wanted to change. I, I understood that it was, it was coming to the understanding that the person that committed that crime, it was immature, it was, it, was, it was wrong in every sense, and my whole train of thinking, it was wrong. The way that I was raised, the way that I thought then, everything was wrong, so I had to rebuild myself. I had to invest time to, to understand who it was that I wanted to be. How old were you when this happened? How old? I was 17. And, and you had you just turned 17? No, ma'am. I was, when, when the crime happened? Yeah. I was 17, yes, ma'am. 
And when was your, what, so you said this happened December 17th? Yes, ma'am. My birthday was on December the 9th. So you had just turned 17. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to get at. You just turned 17. So tell us, you mentioned uh, you've been working on yourself, but I noticed that it seems as though um, you, that focus became more uh, evident after you were resentenced in 2018. When did you start your programs? When did I start my programming? I actually worked in the education department as a, as a prep mentor and facilitator uh, and a tutor. Most of my time, it, it was invested into the education department helping other guys. Uh, I also held various jobs with prison enterprises as a receiving and shipping clerk. And it was a, a, a lot of that. I was concerned with the law. So I felt that I needed to learn the law. So I applied myself to learning the law as best that I could and becoming a student of it. So you did that so you could help your your, your case. Yes, ma'am. And and along the way, help others? Yes, ma'am. Their case. So if I looked at your conduct record, what would it look like? I believe that I have 67 write-ups that are in my conduct record. Most How many? Go my, ahead. Most of them were from just me being immature, me being coming to prison when I arrived at Angola. Angola was still a place of violence. It was still a, a place of a lot of darkness, I can say. And it was adjusting to coming to prison at such a young age. And me being influenced by a lot of people. Well, All right, so let's, what if I looked at it for the last 10 years, what would it look like? It would show that I went through a lot of depression. It would show that I, I lost uh, my family members. And Your conduct was, record would show me that? Ma'am? Your conduct record would show me that? No, not my conduct record. My conduct record would show you that I was involved with contraband, that I was involved with drugs. And that I had a problem and I sought to have that problem reconciled by going to substance abuse classes and entering the new men program. So, so let's talk about that. I see that in November of 22, November of 2022, you, you did have a, a, a contraband, positive drug strain. Yes, ma'am. And in the last 10 years, you've had 17, let's see, in the past 10 years, what I saw, you have 17 write-ups. So I give you the, you know, the adjustment period early on in your, in your incarceration. I give you that because you were young. But in the last 10 years, you've had nine contraband charges and three intoxication charges. Then I see that you uh, most recently in, in, in November of 2022, which is recent in my view, you have taken living in balance. Let's see, when did you do that? In, in this year, in 2023. Yes, ma'am. And since you've taken living in balance, I noticed you haven't had another contraband and you haven't had another intoxication. What did you learn from that class? I learned that being a drug addict is something that you will never, ever fully recover from. It's a step that you take every day. But I understand that the, the damage that drugs does to us, not just to our bodies, but to our minds. And I haven't had a desire since coming to David Wade has been a relief for me in a lot of ways because it has allowed me to cleanse my mind and as well as cleanse my body. 
it allowed me to read. Been there. It. How long have you been there? Um, just like since September of twenty two. Fifteen months, sixteen months. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's good to hear. There is opposition. We'll hear from some uh, soon. Uh, there's law enforcement opposition. The DA's office wants to speak. We'll hear from them. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Let me ask my colleagues any questions. Carter? I noticed that in just since 22, you know, less than well, maybe two years ago, uh, you've three times you've been intoxicated. And I'm just curious why why should we trust you now all of a sudden if you've been in jail for 30 years and to begin with you couldn't follow the rules because you shot somebody and then you've been in jail for 30 years and you just couldn't follow the rules because of 67 write-ups and then even in the last two years the rules say don't get drunk or don't be intoxicated in jail Three, three times in two last two years you've been intoxicated and then other things um, the contraband and, and other things just in the last two years so I'm curious why should we tell me why I should trust you now because every time you've been given an opportunity to do something you screwed it up you hadn't followed the rules so why should I why should I ask or why should I vote that you be allowed to get out and be free in society when you hadn't proven that you can even mind the rules when you're segregated? Sir, my life has been a fight of ups and downs, a battle with chemicals my entire life. I don't there is no way for me to explain or try to justify my actions. I don't attempt to. It is only because of the grace of God that I've been given this opportunity. And I plan to take every advantage of it because I know the responsibility that I have before me. I know that if I continue to do the things that I do, I will always be in these types of situations. And I don't want that for myself. And I don't want to put none of the people who have supported me into that position where they have to feel like I let them down. I, again, it, it has been drugs that has been the catalyst around my life that has led to this negativity. And it, it, it took me to get away from it, to understand this. Because addiction is a part of life. Addiction is something that's strong. And through that addiction, you learn that there is a better you. You just have to be willing to always express it. You have to be always willing to drive towards it. And that's the reason that I feel that if the boy grants me in giving me this opportunity that I can't let you all down. I can't let the people who are in my life that mean the most to me that are still in my life. I can't let them down either. I have a responsibility that God has given me. And that responsibility is to try to change the things that I've done, the wrongs that I've done to try to make a commitment to the people who are out there who are still suffering, who are just like me. Okay. Well, they don't understand it. Okay, thank you. Hey, person. Okay. Uh, Mr. Young, how you doing? How are you doing, sir? Uh, how long have you been in Angola? I stayed in Angola like 28 years, sir. You stayed 28 years? You ever heard of Kairos Ministry? Kyle Ross, yes. did you ever participate? Yes, I did participate in Kyle Ross. You did? Yes, sir. Okay. What do you think about it? How do you feel about it? I think that Kyle Ross was one of the most empowering experiences that I ever had. Especially <laughs> towards the end. 
it it it's, it's, it was emotional for me. I but never, you... yes, sir. I never experienced the the emotions of everyone sharing with one another. I see. So so you you really you feel that you may have a drug problem. Yes, sir, I definitely have a drug problem. And you think you can solve it, or if you got help, you can do better? Going through going through counseling and going through continuous counseling, that's something that I will always do. I see. I, I think that when you are, once you become addicted to drugs, the power of it is knowing the feeling that it gives you. Okay, more All right. Uh, Warden Doza, can you add anything to the conversation? Yes, ma'am. Um, when inmate Young got here, he, he tested positive the night that he got here. That was his last rule violation. And he spent some time in segregation. And um, since then, um, you know, I've, I have noticed a transformation in him in regards to wanting to remain sober and um, talking with him. Uh, multiple times, but specifically last week about his experience here at David Wade and how that's contributed to his sobriety and wanting to live a different version of a different life for himself. Um, he completed Living in Balance. He is a, a barber for our general population. He does really well with that. He also serves as a peer leader for some of our recreation, recreational activities. So he's active in, in those as well and has just completed the, I think, third session with the uh, Victim Offender Dialogue representatives uh, working towards that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't have any other questions. We'd like to hear from the people here in support. Could we hear from the Parole Project? Uh, yes, good morning. Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Um, as um, you may be aware, Parole Project uh, came into creation um, as a result of the Miller Montgomery uh, juvenile uh, uh, Supreme Court rulings. Uh, we're here to support Mr. Young should this board um, decide to, to give him release uh, today. We would offer him transitional housing and support. We would offer him employment opportunities. Uh, we would offer him programming and, and peer mentorship uh, through technology, uh, through uh, essentially social norms, uh, financial management, uh, and financial literacy, the things that someone who's been in, who's been in prison since they were 17 would absolutely need to know. Um, we will provide these services and support as long as he needs, uh, while he has, uh, uh with us, uh, again, he will be living in our transitional housing. One of the things that we would Im immediately do uh, is make sure he's connected to um, any any health services. That includes he'll get an evaluation through our, by our social worker uh, for any any uh, additional uh, treatment uh, recommendations for treatment. And should that uh, tr recommendation come back that he needs uh, inpatient, we'll we'll make sure that that happens. Um, so as part of the overall programming, uh, we just want to make sure Mr. Young has the tools. Uh, and the support systems that are necessary should this board consider his release. Uh, in addition to that, he'll learn consumer skills. He'll learn, uh, the, besides the technology, he'll learn things like how to protect himself, how not to be scammed. He'll learn life, uh, essentially, in our program. Um, but we, again, want to emphasize that should this board uh, grant him today, we will. he will definitely have that evaluation uh, and uh, we'll ensure that he follows any recommendations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Ms. Valle, Katina. You're, you're on mute. Can you unmute your, your microphone? Okay, sorry about that. Good morning. Morning. I live in New York. And, and I believe that Mr. Dwayne Young deserves a chance. And when he's finished with um, transitional housing in Louisiana, I want him to come live with me. And if he needs transitional housing or support with drug program, I can get him into all that. I've been at my job for 19 and a half years. 
I deal with people with physical and mental disabilities, and I've have I have access to all of that. I don't Where, do drugs. I don't drink. Where did you say you are? New York, upstate. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I for live with, I ahead. live where everyone knows one another. Um, I have a niece and a nephew that's in law enforcement. They live here. So I'm around positive people. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for speaking with us this morning. We appreciate the support that you offer, Mr. Young. Uh, at this time, we'll hear from uh, the victim's brother, Joseph Rochelle. Mr. Joseph? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, you know, I I really want to be able to forgive Dwayne for what he did, but uh, some of the things what he said concerning uh, what happened that night. Uh, I don't see how he can say what he said. Uh, I mean, we came down the street and my brother got out and he went to Dwayne across the street. It was 11 o'clock at night, somewhere around there. And uh, he was selling garbage for his concern. Uh, it wasn't real. My brother came back to the truck. He followed him and uh, he pointed the gun at me. My brother never had a gun, so uh, it, it just amazes me that uh, I, I have to <laughs> sit up here and listen. Uh, I don't know where he gets uh, this from. Uh, I mean, he shot my brother. He. My last words my brother say as he was closing the door in the truck was I'm shocked. And uh, he rolls on the floorboard and next thing I knew I got into the hospital. Uh, oh boy, damn, $20 damn rock. Uh, a person losing their damn life. It, it It is so senseless and stupid. I don't give a damn if you're 17. It don't mean, boy. I, uh, I mean, my brother had a had a one year old child, had a wife, and and, and God only knows how far he could have went. And, and I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't know why you was even out there at the time of night. I mean, you should have been in school. Um. Uh, Yes, sir, Mr. Rochelle. We appreciate your remarks. Thank you, sir. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, thank you very much. And, and like I say, I'm sorry for if I did say something unruly, but, uh, you know, it hurts me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, here, I'd like to ask Mr. Young for his statement, and then we'll ask Mr. Johnson with the DA's office to close it out. Mr. Young, what would you like to say? I would both like to thank the board for giving me this opportunity. But more importantly, Mr. Rachel. You just got to speak to the board. No, sir, you got to speak to the board, not to him. Um, I would really like to, to say that the mistake that I made 30 years ago, it was... It was the biggest mistake of my life. I was, I was young, I was stupid. Um, I've never been an aggressive person. I've never intentionally tried to hurt anyone. This night I did. 
this night I destroyed a bunch of lies. Not just the life of Mr. Peter Rachel, but mine as well. As well as that of his of his one year old child and his wife and his mother and father. If it was possible for me to go back and relive this whole moment, I would have never been standing there with crack in my hand. I would have never had a gun on me. And therefore, I could have never shot Mr. Rashel and took him away from his family. Hard to live. I'm sorry for everything that I caused, all the pain, all the hurt. And Mr. Rachel, he has every right to be angry and mad and aggravated with me. But I'm not that same man. I'm not that 17 year old child. I understand the meaning of life. I understand the meaning of family. And I understand that human life is the most precious thing that you have. I hope that I hope that no one else has to go through this. And this is the reason, this is my mission in life now to try to prevent kids from committing stupid and senseless crimes for nothing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Young. All right. I think we're prepared to better. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Please. Yes, ma'am. First off, I want to thank uh, the board for this opportunity to speak. My name is Derek Johnson, Assistant District Attorney with the Rapids Parish Sheriff's uh, Rapids Parish District Attorney's Office. I apologize. Um, just a couple couple of notes that I had written down um, when Mr. Young was speaking. Uh, 17 write-ups in two years. Um, from our standpoint, all, all we hear is excuses. Uh, three times intoxicated. Um, Mr. Young hasn't shown any progress of trying to be a viable member of society. That um, you know, he stated today that he plans on taking every event, every advantage of every opportunity, but it seems that he only took advantage of the discrepancies in the penal system by being able to sneak in controlled um, dangerous um, substances and contraband. You know, in closing, um, drugs were involved in, in, this, in this heinous act, you know, when, when he was 17 years old, and he's failed to eliminate those things that caused his demise. Um, I think um, b before uh, the board can um, will consider releasing him, I think he needs to show that he has been rehabilitated and that for a substantial period of time, instead of just um, taking his word saying that, oh, when I get out, I'll be able to change. And um, that, that's, that's, that's where um, our office stands that we're, we're still strongly opposed to him getting released today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right, uh, at this time, I think we're prepared to vote. I'll be voting first, Mr. Young. You, uh, I'm glad that you were afforded the opportunity that you have there at Wade. It seems as though maybe that is the turning point for you, the change of environment. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm concerned about your write-ups. I, I do believe you need a more sustained period of, of remaining write-up free. Apparently, you are contributing to the population where you're at with, you know, your barber skills and um, such as that. But I, I believe that you really need to do some work on more work on your addiction and get that under control. I think your time is coming, but it's just not today. You know, I think you have some more work to do. Take advantage of opportunities that you have where you're at and continue uh, doing the good work and uh, right back once you've been have a more sustained period of being right up free. My vote today for those reasons is to deny for Mr. Crater. Uh, I vote to deny. Mr. Tilly. Uh, you know, 30 years is a long time. And uh, I believe that you've changed. I really do. Um, 
I hope that you can get some more training to um, get rid of this drug problem. I really believe in my heart that you've changed, but I'm going to have to go ahead and agree with my colleagues. All right, Mr. Young, you've got hope. Don't give up. Keep doing, keep doing it. You can reapply. Good luck.
right, uh, we are back in session. Mr. Baker, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please, sir. Wayne Baker, 368756. All right. Good morning, sir. My name is Cheryl Renatza. This is Mr. Steve Prater to my left, Mr. Chuck Tillis to my right. I want to acknowledge the folks we have uh, with us today. That you can see, we have, uh, let's see, your mother, Miss Betty Baker, your aunt, Rosie Funches, sister-in-law, Catherine Baker, and Mr. Myers with the Parole Project. Uh, in opposition, we have Mr. Wesley Goodman, and uh, a representative from the DA's office in Jefferson Parish. I'll read some identifying information. Mr. Baker asked you to confirm it, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Tillis. Your case has been assigned to him, so he'll take the lead on the interview. Once we finish our questions, we'll ask the warden for her input, and then we'll hear from the folks who've indicated they'd like to speak. You, you'll be allowed to make a statement, after which we'll ask the DA's office to close it out for us. Okay, you ready? All right, uh, Mr. Baker, you're classified as a first felony offender. You're serving a life sentence for a second degree murder conviction in May of 1996 in Jefferson Parish. <clears throat> you have parole eligibility date, which is determined to be uh, February 22nd, 2020. Is that information correct, Mr. Baker? Yes, ma'am. All right, would you answer Mr. Tillis' question, please? Good morning. How are you? Good. I read over your case. Uh, how long have you, or when did you start selling drugs? At a very, oh. at a very oh. early age, um, maybe 14 or 15, so. Okay. Um, how long have you been incarcerated? For 29 years, sir. 29 years. Uh, have you made any changes in the last five years? Yes, sir, I have. You feel you have? Yes, sir. What kind of changes have you think you've made? I've made personal changes in my life since November 22nd, 2022 is when a light bulb switch came on in my head to where I had to get my life together. Um, I grew spiritually, I've matured in, in all areas of my life. Um, okay, uh, 29 years, in the last two years, you, you've kind of made a decision to straighten things out? Well, sir, it's not so much that day, it's like, I had got hooked on drugs, sir. And the drugs had took control of my life. And I was on a down spell. And once I became, once I come to David Wade Correctional Center, I was able to regroup, get around positive people, people with positive minds, mind frames, um, and do what I always know what I'm supposed to do. I see where you, you've taken a lot of classes and, and you've been really uh, trying to make an effort to do what's right. And that's good. That's good. Uh, if you are granted what you're asking for, what are your plans then? What do you plan to do? Plan to go work with a company that my Ain't he on a car company, a car crushing company? But in my spare time, I would like to speak to the youths, guys that been misguided like I have been for all my life, and and in hopes to change a life, help help a kid to go the right path. I can I can assure you that. If given parole today, I would I would never harm another human being. I don't have to be I 
I'm gonna do the right thing even when no one's paying attention. So one last question. It's the last time you did drugs. November 22nd, 2022. Okay. Thank you, sir. So out of all the programs that you've taken, Mr. Baker, which one is have you gotten the most out of? 12 steps, AA. Um, it taught me accountability. It's something um, I take my sobriety serious. Not just with, with doing drugs, it's I take it serious because drugs has been <clears throat> the center point in my life where I've been going downhill ever since drugs came into my life. I've just been going backwards. Everything. Do you go to AA meetings now? Ma'am. Go to AA meetings? Yes, ma'am. How, How often do they have them there? Um, they have them weekly. Once a week now, just like an open call out. Mm -hmm. I, I attend that, but I didn't already achieve. I, I already got the certificate for it, but I still go to it because it's an everyday struggle with drugs, and I I need to be around positive mind frame people that's wanting the same thing that I want. So how long you been there, David Wade? Ma'am. How long you been there? Since November 22nd, 2022. So you were at Angola prior to that? Yes, ma'am. Did you go to AA meetings there? Yes, ma'am, I have. But then you had the positive drug screen. Did you did you test positive when you got there? Or that's why you were moved? Or both, I guess. I, I tested positive once I made it to David Wade Correction Center. And what was the substance? Methamphetamine. And so when you were on the street, what was your drug of choice? Marijuana. And so you, you claim to be a drug dealer? I was both. I, I oh. sold drugs growing up and I, I smoked marijuana recreation. And over the years, uh, maybe last eight years, nine years or so, I started doing harder drugs. Meth or whatever, whatever you could get your hands on? Basically, whatever I got my hands on now. So what substance abuse program, since you've been moved to Wade, what substance abuse program, education or otherwise, have you been able to take? Got my high set. Now I'm talking about substance abuse. I did see you got your high set. You got that just last year. Congratulations, I think in November. Thank you, ma'am. Um, AA, uh, Living in Balance, Toastmasters, um, What'd you get out of Living in Balance? What'd you learn? The most important thing you learned? The most important thing I learned is that you need accountability for it, someone to speak to. Don't be ashamed to speak out what it is that 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 good. So you have a you have an accountability partner now? Yes, ma'am. I have a few. What's your job there? What do you do? I work on crew one, ma'am. But what's crew one? Well, they they work outside the gate, but oh. lately they have not been working. So in my spare time, what I've been doing is I tutor guys in the dormitory with mathematics and language. And also I'm a peer. Leader in sports activities, ma'am. So you're a trustee? I have what they have, what they call an honor card. I don't know if that's classified as a trustee up here, but I wouldn't I wouldn't know the answer to that. 
Well, I'm going to ask Warren does that for that answer. Yes, ma'am. No, he's not a trustee. He is an honor inmate. And like you said, he does participate as a peer leader in our recreational activities. Um, he's assigned to the field crew, but due to staffing issues and such, we don't have a field crew going out currently. Um, he did, what, like you said, uh, test a positive for methamphetamine the night that he got here and did uh, a pretty significant amount of time in segregation. And since he's remained back in general population, I've seen some positive things from him. Like you said, he did his high set. He did go to uh, and join and complete the AA 12 step programs. He is active in our weekly meetings for AANA, and he is currently on the waiting list for a surf safe program through education, which should begin in the next couple of weeks or so. Thank you. Any questions? No. You, uh, about the correction system, but that would be okay. okay. All right. Um, let's see. Let, uh, we'll hear from the folks who are here in support. First, we'd like to hear from your mom, Ms. Betty Baker. My name is Betty Baker. I'm Dwayne Baker's mother. I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak on his behalf. Um, Dwayne is the second of three sons and the father of a beautiful daughter and one grandson. His release would mean the world to his family. It's been a long journey. And with his rehab, I think he would make a great access to the community. I acknowledge his time away and uh, so that he can, he would like to come home and help the young folks in the community to help them get their lives straight. And he has shown remorse for the crime that he was convicted of. And uh, if he's granted a pardon today, it would mean the world to us. And he will have family support, community support, and a job. Um, yes. I'm here. Ma'am, thank you. We appreciate your input. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Hear from Ms. Rosie Funches. Good morning. I'm Rosie Funches. And I'm a co owner of a car crossing business with my husband. Located in Jefferson Parish and in Mississippi. Um, we have um, decided to allow Wayne to work with the company, but he won't be going to Mississippi. He'll be working locally with uh, with my husband and my son. Um, everybody makes mistakes, whether they're minor or major, but we are in total support of the Wayne, and we're praying that you all allow him the opportunity to get into um, society. It's been 29 years, like you say, and 29 years is a long time for a child to be incarcerated. And uh, we're looking forward to make some lifelong changes, both personally, physically, religiously, and just be a backbone for him because 29 years incarcerated, he's going to have a lot of changes he's going to have to make to all of the changes that are in society. But I want you all to know that he has a lot of family support. He has a lot of uh, support from the church. And we just want you all to know that if you allow him this opportunity, uh, he will have support and we will be on him like white on rice. Well, thank you, ma'am. We appreciate your input. Uh, could we hear from the Parole Project? Yes. Uh, good morning, still. Uh, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Um, again, just you know, to reiterate, Mr. Uh, Baker was 17 years old, um, a, a juvenile when this crime was committed. Uh, the capacity for juveniles to change is, has been recognized uh, not only by mental health professionals, but by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, Mr. Baker has struggled, uh, obviously, through his uh, life with his addictions, uh, but you can see the hard work that he's done. We will continue to help him. Uh, should this board grant him uh, uh, parole today, we will continue to help him 
uh, we'll, to make sure he's, while he's in our program, make sure he's continued to be connected to, to AANA. Um, we'll provide him a substance abuse evaluation uh, through our, our, our social work staff and, and ensure that he follows uh, any recommendation through that staff, uh, of, of any recommendation that, that, that social worker makes. His, uh, his adjustment uh, in our program will, um, and again, that's, that's what we're set up to do for people who have served long sentences like uh, Mr. Baker. Uh, we, we will help him through that transition with technology, uh, make sure he has all his documentation you know, he already has employment and he has a long-term residence, uh, but we're going to give him that 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 cushion, that time uh, to essentially uh, detox uh, from prison, uh, if if for lack of a better term. We'll provide him the the, the case management. We'll provide him the mentoring uh, in the things like social norms to get again to to allow him to be able to reintegrate uh, the technology, the financial literacy. Um, it is, you know, it, it continues and will always be our mission uh, to assist people like Mr. Baker uh, in their transition to be successful. And as you know, our program has been highly successful. So we believe should this board uh, grant Mr. Baker today, uh, the, the combination of our program and the family support, um, Mr. Baker will be successful. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll hear from the opposition now. Could we hear from Mr. Wesley Goodman? He's he's uh, apparently logged out. We're going to try to get in touch with him. In the meantime, Mr. Baker, is there a statement you'd like to say to the board? Yes, the incident that took place. It's one that I'm gonna live with for the remainder of my life. Also, it's a it's an incident that I'm sincerely, heartfully, and remorsefully regretful towards. Silently. I ask God for repentance and to live the family and loved ones up of the victim in prayers in hopes that One day they find it in their hearts to forgive me. All right, thank you, sir. We, we, we can't reach them, so if we'd like to go ahead and ask uh, Mr. Meyer, would you close it out for us? Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. Um, I spoke to Mr. Goodman over the weekend, uh, and he express strong opposition to parole for Mr. Baker. Um, I've also spoken to other victims and I would note in the record there are, uh, I want to say, about five or six victims uh, who did respond, all of whom were opposed, uh, one, two, three, four, looks like five, all of whom were opposed to his request for parole. Um, the concerns I have with Ms. and we're opposed as well, and the concerns I have with Mr. Baker's request is first, um, he didn't, y'all didn't ask him about the, the offense and the facts surrounding the offense. Uh, he was two months shy, roughly two months shy of his 18th birthday when the shooting occurred. Um, what happened in the offense, Mr. Goodman and his, his wife drove up to the to the scene to buy some drugs. Uh, they were making the transaction. And what Mr. Goodman advised me was that Mr. Baker came up with a gun and tried to rob both the person who was selling him the drugs and them of the drugs. They sped off and Mr. Baker shot 
numerous times at the vehicle to the fleeing vehicle. Um, you, you know, his people, you know, trying to get away from a guy coming up at him with a gun. What's concerning to me is if we look at the uh, juvenile lifer evaluation, which was conducted on 12 28 of 23, it states, uh, I believe, on the second page that uh, according to M.A. Baker, on the night of the offense, he was selling crack cocaine. A van drove up, drove up for what appeared to be a drug purchase. The driver of the van attempted to steal cocaine and immediately drive off. Subsequently, M.A. Baker fired several shots at the fleeing van, fatally, in, fatally injuring a female passenger. It's uh, a little bit different factual um, a little bit different factually from what Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Goodman has advised occurred that evening that they actually had, you know, made a deal on some on some drugs, and Mr. Baker came up to rob them. Other concerns I have are 132 disciplinary reports since he's been incarcerated. He's had disciplinary reports every year of his incarceration, except 2015, 2016. 23 and so far in 2024, he's had no disciplinary reports. The last offense was November 22 of 22, um, which was the, the positive test for methamphetamines that he uh, talked about. Looking since 20, well, including 2014, since 2014, he's had seven contraband reports, two sex offenses, and two intoxication reports. Um, I, I, I would be, uh, I'm, I'm concerned with the number of disciplinary reports while he's been incarcerated and the lack of time since his last disciplinary report and today. I would like to see more time between that final disciplinary report that he's had in November of 22 and the time that he is, is released. Um, the report also talked about, the LIFER report also talked about the need of vocational programs, looking at the programs that he's uh, completed while incarcer incarcerated, there's really no vocational programs that would assist him in being able to obtain a job. Although his family, uh, his uncle has indicated that they will have a job for him. I'd like to see some vocational programs that would assist him. And the, the time period that he has been involved with the use of drugs, including the many years that he's incarcerated, I think, uh, a successful completion of a long-term substance abuse program would be appropriate in uh, before he is being considered for release. So for those reasons, we're opposed to his request for parole. All right. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. We always appreciate your input. Uh, <clears throat> I will make a motion for executive session to discuss confidential matters. Can I get a second? Yes, Can we do a roll call? Yes. Chairman Yes. Chuck Tibbs? Yes. Steve Yes. Okay, we'll be uh, in executive session to discuss confidential matters. We'll be back shortly.
All right. All right. Thank you. We are back in regular session. Let's see. And we will be voting. Mr. Tillis will be voting first. Uh, I'm going to vote that upon our completion of long term to Steve Barbie program, uh, that you be granted and then to the uh, project parole. All right, Mr. Prater. I concur. All right, and uh, Mr. Baker, you, you know, you, you, your conduct record hasn't been good uh, until lately. We've talked about it, um, but I think <clears throat> I'm in agreement with my colleagues. You, you really need the substance abuse treatment. Are you familiar with the Steve Hall program? You heard about it? It's an intensive substance abuse program. I think y'all are still on mute. It's an intensive substance abuse program, and we're sending you to the long-term program. So you get the tools that you need to conquer your addiction, and then you got to follow up. They'll recommend a, a plan, uh, a treatment plan after release, and you got to follow that plan. Yes. All right. Parole projects will give you some additional counseling. So today, sir, your parole has been granted. But it, you've got some work to do with the Steve Hall program. Yes, ma'am. All right, good luck to you. Much, Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that, uh, we're going to sign off from David Wade. It is 12.07. Y'all have a good afternoon. Y'all have a good day.
Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Good afternoon. Mr. Davis, is that you? Yeah. Y'all are on your your uh your device is on mute. Is there anybody in the room with you that can unmute it? Can you hear us? We need it. Maybe maybe the volume needs to be turned louder. We can't hear y'all. Can you hear me? Oh, now I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm Miss James. No, I'm I'm talking to the jail. So, is there anybody there in the room with you, Mr. Davis, that can turn the volume up? All right, we seem to be having some audio issues. We're going to call the, the jail and try to resolve it real quick.
Pardon, Judy? Yes. All right. We are, uh, let me go through those preliminaries. Hold, hold, Wait, hold on. I'm getting a little feedback. So, uh, Warden Jude, you're in the room with the offender. Could y'all turn off y'all's mic uh, speaker in there with him? All right. I think that's better. So, uh, for the record, Warden Jude, would you introduce yourself? Uh, Warden Steve Jude was at Rich. Okay, thank you. And we have Mr. Davis here in front of us. Good morning. Good afternoon, Mr. Davis. Would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number. All right, Mr. Davis. And let me recognize the folks you can probably see on the screen. I want to recognize your aunt Nicole Harris, your aunt Leticia James, and Takeda Marshall, your girlfriend, and your aunt Nicole will be speaking on your behalf at the appropriate time. First, let me just read some identifying information into the record, and then we're going to have a parole interview with you, okay? All right. So, Mr. Davis, you are classified as a second felony offender. You're currently serving a 30-year sentence. You were sentenced September 2021 in Washita Parish, criminal conspiracy to commit second-degree murder. Your parole eligibility date was September 27, 2023. And your good time date is October 15, 2025, with full term being in March of 2046. Is that information correct? So, um, Mr. Mr. Davis, explain to us, you were on supervision at the time this particular crime occurred. What were you on supervision for? Aggravated battery. And you also have, I think, Another felony conviction, which is also a violent offense. Is that right? Uh, uh, right. But you have three felony convictions, all of which are violent offenses. So let's talk about the conspiracy to commit, what you're there for now, the conspiracy to commit second degree murder. That offense happened in March of 2016. Is that right? Uh, and you were you've been in jail since March of 2016 for that crime. Yes, and but you weren't sentenced until 2021. No. Okay. Tell us what happened uh that night that the murder occurred. Mr. Davis, wait, wait, stay by Mr. Davis. Warden Juge, can you put the microphone a little closer to him so we can hear him better? Multiple times, right? Twice. Okay. Twice, three, twice. So, so the other uh, violent offenses that I was referring to, you had an arrest in December of 2009 for aggravated second degree battery. You received a 15 year sentence that was suspended all but three years, but you had another arrest in uh, December of that year for aggravated second degree battery. Same sentence, different docket numbers. Right? Yes, so you re you remember that name? Yes, ma'am. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, ma'am. All right. So what I'm a little confused and concerned about, frankly, is you were on supervision. You got out on good time in April of 2015. And 11 months later, you have this arrest. Yes, ma'am. And so you, you pled guilty, right, to it an amended charge of conspiracy wow. and you agreed to that wow. and you received a 30-year sentence 
Okay. So let's talk about what you've been doing. I see where you did, uh, you have anger management. You did that in 2013. You did living in balance also in 2013 before you got out before. Uh, this current period of incarceration, you've done the Steve Hoyle program. What did you get out of that program? I got a lot out of the Steve Hoyle program. Fish management and Right. Um, wait, 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 let's go back a bit. I wanted to know what you got out of the Steve Hoyle program. What's the most important thing you learned from that program? Um, the most important thing I learned from the Steve Hoyle program is about my sobriety. It comes with my sobriety and um Good. So what are you doing now to maintain your sobriety? How do you do that? Uh, right now, I'm just I'm just here, um, I cook in the kitchen and I cut hair um, to keep me busy and um, just trying to help people get So you're not, are you in, are you, are you, you're not in the work release program? I'm a are you in the work release program or you just live at that facility? Yeah, but do you work? Do you work outside of the facility? No. Doubt. No. So your job in there is do you cook and you work in the kitchen. I mean, in your barber. Yes, no. Okay. And you don't you don't do anything. When's the last time you were drug tested? Uh, about about two hundred years ago. Good. And you, how'd that come out? All right. Good. I'm a <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Look, I, I have concerns about your violent past and your violent history. I'm really pleased about the Steve Hall program and that you, you have a plan to deal with your sobriety. Um, whenever you're released, whenever that might be, how are you going to stay sober? Do they have AA meetings there where you're at, Neil? Um, they don't have. Okay. Um, <clears throat> where are you going to work? I see. Before you came to jail, did you have a valid driver's license? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, you have any questions? Good. Uh, Warden Jews, what can you tell us about Mr. Davis? Uh, you've been a bottle of the best. Oh, good. Uh, he hasn't had any rounds. No, right. <clears throat> Mr. Davis, I want you to know that you have some opposition to an early release. You have an opposition from the uh, from the district attorney um, in Washington Parish, as well as law enforcement. Uh, at this time, we want to hear from your Aunt Nicole. Ms. Harris, could we hear from you, please? Hello, can y'all can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm here. Go ahead, what would you like us to know? Okay, first of all, I would like everyone to know that over the years with speaking on the phone with Charles and listening to him and telling me about all the classes that he have taken. Um, also considering his health, um, I'm going to help him get a job and maintain a job. I'm well um, networked into community. So I have a few people that's going to get a job, help me get him a job so he can stay working. And just be very supported on them. Um, we lost 
my sister his mom to diabetes, which is the same health issue that Charles is dealing with, and we are concerned about that. But I just see the change in him, and um, he have a son that's going to be graduating soon, high school. I just know that this time is going to be a better time for him. Good. Well, thank you, ma'am. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Mr. Davis, is there something you'd like to say to us before we vote? Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Davis, I think we're prepared to vote. I'll be voting first. I have concern. I like what you said, but you're doing well where you're at and you want to get this behind you. Uh, I have concerns about your history, your violent, violent history, your criminal record. Um, I mentioned that we have law enforcement opposition. You know, you were on supervision at the time this happened. And, and you had already, at that time, you had already taken anger management classes. And so I have, I have some concern about your ability to control your anger. So today, my vote today is going to be to deny your parole. I think you're doing well. Warden G says you're doing well where you're at. I would recommend that if they have our program opportunities there for you, that you do take advantage of it, particularly a victim awareness and anger management class if they have it. So that's my vote, sir. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Mr. Prater? Uh, I concur. Both of them. And Mr. Tillis? I agree with my colleagues. I'll deny it this time. All right, Mr. Davis. Today, your parole's been denied. Take advantage of any programs that Warden Junich has to offer for you. You can, uh, you'll be getting out before you're eligible to reapply, but make yourself a good plan and uh, your family's there to support you. Good luck to you, sir. Warren Juice, thanks for accommodating us by the phone. Uh, we're going to sign off. It's 1242 p.m.